is Biden crippling the auto industry is the the question that's at the forefront of this conversation. Is Biden crippling the auto industry? There are people within the industry that's saying that it's Biden's fault. The Biden's fault as to why a lot of this is happening in the auto industry also. I have my own particular opinion about it, but I promised y'all I would get to this. Make sure y'all hit a like for the algorithm. Let's get into the conversation. Uh, this is Biden giving his opinion very, very late, might I, might I add. This is Biden giving his opinion on what's going on in the auto industry and what automakers should be doing for their employees. Go to the White House now. We're going to hear from the president regarding the auto strike. I'd like to say a few words about the contract negotiations between the United Auto Workers and the big three. I'm going to be reading Super Chats throughout the show. Auto companies, you know, I've been in touch with both parties over since this began over the last few weeks and over the last the past decade. Auto companies have uh, seen record profits, including the last few years, because of the extraordinary skill and sacrifices of UAW workers. But those record profits have not been shared fairly, in my view, with those workers, just as the Treasury Department has released a report pointing out that the most comprehensive report ever dealing with how unions are good for both union workers and... He, he, they need to get him some glasses. He keeps squinting at the screen of what it is that he's reading. He doing like this the whole time. And the union workers and what they doing and what they got going on and all of that. They need to get him some glasses. Shout out to Biden. He got them good contacts, I'm assuming. Non-union workers to and the overall economy. Unions raise workers' wages, they said. Incomes. Increase home ownership. Increase retirement savings. Increase access to critical benefits like sick leave and child care. And reduce inequality all of which strengthen our economy for all workers. That's because unions, unions raise standards across the workplaces and entire industries, pushing up wages and strengthening benefits for everyone. That's why strong unions are critical to the growing economy and growing from the middle out, the bottom up, not the top down. That's especially true as we transition to a clean energy future, which we're in the process of doing. I believe that transition should be fair and a win-win, excuse me, for auto workers and <laughs> auto companies. But I also believe the contract agreement must lead to a vibrant made in America future that promotes good, strong middle class jobs that workers can raise a family on. Where the UAW remains at the heart of our economy and where the big three companies continue to lead in innovation, excellence, quality, and leadership. Last night. What? What is he talking about? They playing catch up to everybody, including Tesla. On average, they lose for every single EV that they sell in order to drive costs out. They're, they're leveraging the profits that they make from internal combustion engine vehicles in order to continue to supplant what it is that they're trying to develop and then bring here in the United States of America. What is he talking? <laughs> they continue to lead in innovation. No, they're not. After negotiations broke down, the UAW announced the targeted strike at a few big three auto plants. L let's be clear. No one wants a strike. Say it again. No one wants a strike. But I respect workers' right to use their options under the collective bargaining system. And I understand the workers' frustration. Over generations, auto workers sacrificed so much to keep the industry alive and strong, especially through the economic crisis and the pandemic. Open your eyes, Biden. Open your eyes, big dog. You can't even read the prompter that well. Come on, man. Hey, get that extra big fine up on there. I'm following, though. I'm following. I'm going to break it down from a C student's perspective. Workers deserve a fair share of the benefits they help create for an enterprise. I do appreciate that the parties have been working around the clock. I, and when I first called them at the very first day of the negotiation, I said, please stay at the table as long as you can to try to. I called them when they first started negotiating, and I was telling them, hey, stay at the table as long as you can, because we got to get this deal done, guys. Since July, they've been negotiating at the table, and I was telling them, hey, you guys need to stay at the table. Hey, everybody, stay at the table, because we got to get this deal done for all Americans. <laughs> well, let me finish hearing what he got to say. We'll work this out. And they've been around the clock, and the companies have made some significant offers. But I believe they should go further to ensure record corporate profits mean record contracts for the UAW. Let me say that again. Record corporate profits, which they have. 
should be shared by record contracts for the UAW. <laughs> and just as we're building an economy of the future, we need labor agreements for the future. It's my hope that the parties can return to the negotiation table to forge a win-win agreement. To continue our active engagement, I'm, dis I'm deploying, dispatching two members of my team to Detroit, Acting Labor Secretary Julie Hsu and White House Senior Advisor Gene Sperling, both of whom have been involved up to now, to offer their full support for the parties in reaching a contract. The bottom line is... Then Kamala Harris, let's see if we can get a done, deal done with her. ...that auto workers help create America's middle class. They deserve a contract that sustains them in the middle class. Thank you very much. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Now, I'm under the impression, because I want to get a completely different perspective from a former, um, a former CEO over at the, uh, <laughs> a former CEO over at the automakers, because I want to get his perspective, because he had a unique breakdown. But let me give you my thoughts, right? All of this is just a farce. All of this is just presentation layer. It's smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. Let me tell you why it's smoke and mirrors. Biden, Biden is trying to secure an endorsement from UAW members in order for him to have the support of the of these blue collar workers for the upcoming presidential election. So he had to say something. Biden is trying to secure support because the UAW is leveraging their membership and their power and numbers in order to hold out an endorsement for president of the United States, which is one of the reasons why he had to come out here and say this in the first place. And that's a fact, though. The you, you look it up. The UAW has largely expressed their displeasure and their withholding of an endorsement of Biden for president of the United States because they have not gotten the support that they feel like they need in order for them to continue to secure a historic contract against the automakers. And so he had to come out and say this. He had to come out and say this. What do you think? Listen, listen. Pandering for votes is not what we're advocating for from our elected officials. We want them to make an informed decision based off of their own insight, not so that they can try to get a vote from Democrats. Not so they can try to get a vote from the UAW. Not so they can get an endorsement so the UAW can say, hey, everybody go and vote for Biden. We want you to give your own thoughts, not the thing that they're saying. The same playbook, the same agenda that's being spread across the United States of America. We tired of that. We want to know what your real thoughts are. And then we want to know what role you're playing when it comes to how the automakers are then being affected by your policies that's going on in the White House. Well, let's deep dive into it. We got more information. UAW President Sean Fain rejecting a 21% pay increase offer from Stellantis over the weekend, saying that it's a, quote, no-go. Joining me right now is the former Chrysler uh, CEO and Home Depot chairman and CEO, as well as Accelerate uh, LLC founder and CEO, Bob Nardelli. Bob, it's great to see you. Thanks very much for weighing in on this important issue. You've dealt with unions your entire career. Uh, how do you view we want to get an industry insider in here to give his perspective of what's going on between the UAW and the automakers, not just based off of what Biden is telling us, but based off of how it is that he can communicate more effectively, how Biden has affected what's going on in the negotiating table. Let's go into this. Yes. Well, Maria, thank you for having me on. I was I was encouraged that Stellantis uh, did put an offer on the table over the weekend. And of course, I was disappointed to see uh, a flat out rejection. Bri, I think this thing, given the tone of it right now, that it, both sides have become very polarized, I think this is going to go on for a while. I think the, the union, UAW, is dug in. I think the companies are now dug in. And I think we are woefully underestimating the financial impact on this strike. I've lived through this to your point. Customers are now going to become very jaundiced. Do they order a car? If they do, how long will it take to get? What will the quality be? If you already own a car, What's the serviceability from the dealership? Remember, this is far bigger than just three plants on strike. Every city, every state has dealers that will be affected by this. They're saying that the potential cost to the economy as UAW strike in just 10 days could be $5.6 billion impact to the economy all across different sectors, different states, different industries, different households. 
the impact in just 10 days could be that of about $5.6 billion. That's a big number, y'all. They'll start, you know, depleting their inventory. They'll start laying their salesmen off. They will eventually lay off their technicians. So this thing has broad and deep tentacles that will affect our economy. You've talked about uh, energy and fuel, uh, $90 a barrel. Uh, I just filled up my tank uh, on Saturday. Now, the good news is this administration's doing nothing, but our state governor is. He reduced the sales tax on fuel until we can get something in place uh, to get energy costs down. So I think this will have far implications for a long time, Maria. Wow, I think that's really interesting that you've got state governors trying to address this issue as oil prices surge with what you're seeing in Georgia. But, Bob, I want to get your take on who wins and loses here because I keep making the point, you know who's not striking? The employees at Toyota. Let me just say something. She look a mess. You know me. I, I, I can't ignore what it is that I see because I think that, that communication is 90%. Uh, body language and presentation is not just what you say. This lady, whoever she is, and I know y'all know who she is. She's probably a regular person on Fox News or whatever, so on and so forth. This lady looked a hot. She looked like she just came from the bar. She just got done drinking. That they had some hot, good, if you know what I'm saying, at the same time. And then she jumped on the air right after that, after she took a, a pill in order to try to clear up her eyes. She look a mess out here in these streets. Toyota, the employees at Tesla. Is this a quiet victory for Elon Musk and Tesla? There's no question, Maria, that uh, when we went through this in 7, 8, and 9, there weren't nearly the optionality out there today. But you can see Honda, Hyundai, Tesla. I mean, there's a plethora of, of alternatives for a consumer to purchase a car. Now, here's another important point. If one of the big three loses a sale, they're probably going to lose it for 12.2 years. That's the average age of the installed base of the car park today. So it's not like, well, when, we, when the strike ends, we're immediately going to be able to pick up where we left off. That is not true. We had the same issue again back in 789. An interesting article was in the AJC over the weekend with Carol Tomei. She acknowledged that they lost tremendous customer support just during the negotiations because people wanted to make sure their goods would still flow. Their competition then locked these people in for multiple years. So just the, just the fact of going through a negotiation had negative impact on those companies. We're going to see the same thing with the big three. And, of course, your point earlier, we're forcing a conversion to electric vehicles far beyond its time. There is no installed base to support the demands that are being put out by this administration for electric vehicles. We saw the Inflation Reduction Act then finally come true, has nothing to do with that. It's all about the green movement. So we're under tremendous pressure in this economy right now with inflation out of control and nothing's being done by the administration except the feds who are raising interest rates that are just pounding the, the mid-market mid companies. Interest rates in some of my middle market companies have gone from $2 million to 14 million. Basically, 100% of free cash flow, Maria, is going to pay the, the, the interest rates. And it's, it's causing tremendous dislocation in our economy. So basically, what he's saying is that Biden, through his pushing of this green movement, is also affecting uh, the transition over into electric vehicles because now it's affecting the bottom line of the automakers and forcing them to invest in things where consumers may or may not even be able to be interested in these uh, in these automakers or in these electrif electrified vehicles in a sense, right? So he's basically saying that Biden is crippling the auto industry by forcing them over into the green movement where consumers are not necessarily interested in taking it in, in taking this pathway. And I think that he's wrong. I think that he's wrong. I'm going to be objective because that's who I am, and I'm going to shoot Biden some bell. I believe that he's wrong. I believe that if you're going to compete, especially worldwide, it is happening in China. It is happening in Switzerland. It has happened in so many different countries and places across the board where they've basically adopted and they've evolved past their current search circumstance and they've used profits from their current industries in order to continue to propel, them for, propel themselves forward in new industries, you have to invest in the future. You have to invest in infrastructure. You have to invest in 
uh, the electrification of cars because that's where the industry is going. The problem with electrification is not necessarily the cars themselves, right? The problem is that people have worries with regard to the infrastructure behind electrification. They don't think that they'll be able to find a charger. They don't like what will happen, right? Of course, you're going to have people to say, well, I like the sound of gas cars and so on and so forth. But you can't have two things at the same time. You can't have an industry that says that we don't want to be dependent on foreign oil in order to continue to build up, especially with regard to what it is that we're dealing with, with, with foreign relations. But then at the same time, we don't want to invest in infrastructure to continue to build up the industry that's now going to have the majority of the jobs in the United States of America. Because then what will happen is we will have to outsource jobs to other countries especially with regard to the things that we don't build here in America in order to continue to supply due to supply and demand for what people are going to be purchasing in the future. It's just a fact. But industry is moving over to electrification until they move over to something else. Internal combustion engines are, are a large co cost that they've largely tried to drive out the majority of the cost and it's reached a ceiling. In order to drive out costs as far as what the long-term effects of electrification is, right, the cost of the battery, less parts, manufacturing processes, so on and so forth, bringing jobs over, research and development, you have to bring that stuff into the United States of America because it is a global game. The world is not waiting for us to do anything going forward. It is now in a space to where it's innovating, it's adopting policy, it's adopting electrification, it's adopting AI, it's adopting technology, semiconductor chip shortage. This is why the United States of America is fighting so hard as far as to make sure that semiconductor chips stay far and ahead of what it is that they have going on worldwide. And the next war is poss possibly over in Taiwan because China is trying to secure semiconductor chips that is advanced enough for them to continue to compete over here in America. That's a fact. And so he's actually wrong on this, in my opinion. He's wrong on this because you have to. Again, one of the problems that's happening in America is the infrastructure. The infrastructure is not keeping up with the technology. When you talk about self-driving cars, when you talk about semiconductor chips, when you're talking about electrification, we don't have the infrastructure to actually support the people that then would consider buying these cars if they could. You cannot have the Model Y last quarter being the number one selling car in the world and then make the case to say that people are, are not necessarily adopting technology that would then push them forward. That's a lie. It's a lie. It drives out the cost. It continues to innovate for the automakers, and that's why they look at themselves as technology companies, not as just manufacturers. So I think that he's partially right, but it's not entirely right based off of the conversations that he's having right now. You cannot lay this at the feet of Biden. He is creating legislation that actually pushes him forward and incentivizes these companies to continue to invest in the United States of America. He's wrong on that. I do not think that it's Biden's fault that he's crippling the auto industry. I think that he's creating policy that then substantiates that we need to go forward in this technology movement that's then going to be profitable more similar to what it is that you see happening over at Tesla. Wow, that, that is insanity, Bob. Th this, you are making such important points. And, you know, the ripple effects, I know we're going to see massive sticker shock as well. Car prices are going to go up. But all of this, this, this is probably the clearest sign yet of how bad policy can destroy uh, an economy. Bad policy uh, equals bad outcomes for American citizens. Liz Peek is with me this morning, and she's written a great op-ed about just this. Liz, jump in here and talk about your... You know what's so funny? When uh, Ford Motor Company invented the, the, the assembly line, right, and he started putting together Model Ts, at that time, people said, we don't want cars. We want faster. We want better horses. That's what they said. They said, we don't want cars. We want faster and better horses. In the same way that you guys are sitting here fighting against the thing that's going to be best for you long term. Most of you people have never even driven an EV, so you don't really know what the benefits are. It's funny because we've saved so much money in gas and that we haven't actually went to a gas station. And I don't know how long until we had to have the Porsche inside of the shop and whatever, right? A lot of people have no clue because they've never even explored the possibility of what technology can do for them going long term. So you can fight it all you want to. It doesn't mean that the industry isn't going to continue to change. You don't want that's going to be left behind because you're not understanding that everything is cyclical and everything is going to continue to evolve. And again, when Tesla has the most demand and they were the number one selling vehicle, the Model Y was the number one selling vehicle worldwide last quarter, worldwide, you can't fight it. 
You cannot fight it, bro. You can sit here and try to debate it, but you can't fight it. Not bad how Joe Biden can destroy the auto sector. Well, I, I think he's well on his way to destroying the auto sector with the EV mandates that he's pushed through. But I'm interested in what Mr. Nardelli thinks about Joe Biden weighing in on this strike and basically coming down on the side of the union workers and demanding uh, that the car makers up their up their offer because there are a whole bunch of unions waiting to see how this turns out. I think the implications you say totally right are broader Thanks for the economy this. than we're imagining. But also I think we're going to see this filter into other labor settlements that are going to raise inflation, and make it very difficult for the Fed to sit still on rates. What is your thinking about Biden's comments over the weekend? Yeah, well, clearly he's desperate for the UAW's endorsement, right? That's number one. Right. I agree. I think that that's the whole reason why. And we can debate EVs back and forth. Listen, you know that I open up the, the panel for y'all to come up here on Friday. Maybe I'll do it on Thursday. Who knows? We can debate EVs all day. The fact of the matter is this. Biden made that speech over the weekend because he was looking for the endorsement of the UAW, not necessarily because he was concerned with what was going on in the negotiating room between the UAW and leadership over at the automakers. Right. Number two, your, your other point is exactly on target. You know, the UAW is looking over the fence. They saw UPS get a 40% increase. They saw American Airlines get a big increase. They saw the dock workers on the West Coast get a big increase. They're standing in line and saying, hey, it's my turn. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really think this thing will go on for a protracted period, unfortunately. And again, the administration is doing nothing to curb inflation. Matter of fact, they have created it with surrendering energy independence. The uh, it's funny because I got your car in the, in, the, in the chat, right? And he thinks he knows. If you're not familiar, literally almost six months ago, I started investing in and having conversations with different gas station owners in order to build and invest in uh, level three chargers. And, and a lot of y'all that's familiar with the Millionaire Morning Show, some of you guys are familiar with me saying this. Um, one of my investments that I've been making capital investments in, and I've been having these conversations for an extended period of time about the technology, understanding it, and so on and so forth. And we actually have our first one going in um, into a gas station, and it's costing me roughly between fifty and fifty-five thousand dollars in order to install it per charger. Um, we're installing level three chargers at gas stations today because we're trying to solve for and get get credits, and we're actually getting some some money on the back end. But that's all another conversation. Join the Patreon link is in the description as well as pinned to the top of the chat. It shows me how little you know because you think you know, but I'm intimately familiar with the technology because I've already started putting my money up as far as investing in these gas stations to convert. One or two of their pumps each gas station over in the level three chargers. So I'm familiar with what it takes in order to power these things. And it's not what you said in the chat. I've been working with the power companies because you have to in order to get the level three chargers installed at the gas stations. So you're just talking. You don't even know what you're talking about. See, this is what I, what I, what I mean as far as different people saying stuff. They don't know what the fuck they talk. Let me, let me stop. They don't know what they're talking about. Listen, you either going to embrace the technology or you're going to get left behind. That's just a fact, though. I'm not going to break it down. I'm not going to talk on here because I've already started putting together the presentation so I can show the people of what it is that I'm investing in inside of the Patreon so they can make their own decisions. The fact of the matter is you have no idea what you're talking about. Y'all just be talking. Inflation Reduction Act was not correct. It was all about the green movement. So nothing yeah. is being done on that side, and this president is desperate for an endorsement. Oh, that's right. And, and you know, and they won't endorse him. The, the auto uh, makers, uh, workers still will not endorse him. And we've got the Kelly Blue Book now reporting that the average cost for a new car last month is sitting at over $48,000, used cars, $26,000, and electric vehicles at over $53,000, Bob. We're looking at sticker shock in the auto business already, and the strike is only in its fourth day. How? Yeah, I think that this is going to be a problem. The, the the unfortunate part is that I think that it is always popular to blame blame legislators such as Biden. I do blame Biden for pandering in order to try to get a uh, UAW endorsement. However, I will not say it's his fault for continuing to push the country as far as legislative policies. Now, if you start to, d to deep dive into those Build Back Better plan and the infrastructure deal, 
It's a lot of stuff in there that I don't agree with because it's a lot of little different things that we did not take into consideration uh, that people didn't read because they're not familiar with what these policies are. But the fact of the matter is continuing to incentivize people to invest in a technology that you got to compete with worldwide uh, should not be his problem. You have to put it on the people. That's the whole idea behind capitalism is that you can't come back and blame the president. Um, for the for the circumstance that you find yourself in, you got to take ownership and responsibility. But I do think that the UAW is making a mistake by not taking these deals as being laid out on the table. Uh, but that's just my personal opinion.